think I am ready to rock. So in this video, we will talk about Webpack 5 and all the new stuff that it offers. Let's roll. You can watch this video either on YouTube. And if you do, please consider subscribing or liking or whatever you do and whatever YouTubers keep asking. I don't ask very often, but you know, once in a while cannot hurt. Um, and the other way that you can watch this video is probably by being forced, right? You're at a meetup or you're at a conference and this is one of those pre-recorded talks that you'll be watching. So because of that, I will also introduce myself because you kind of want to know your speaker, right? Who is this that is talking to you? On a YouTube video that might be a little bit off. So you can find chapter markers in the video so you can switch if you wanted to. So let's dive in and marvel at this you know, hours worth of Photoshop that I did for this talk. Um, here we go. So Aris, who is um, organizing this meetup, um, link in the description, he told me, Tim, Webpack 5 is awesome, but it's also fantastic. And 4 was also fantastic, but now we are 5. So why not do some like Fantastic 4 kind of superhero theme? And I thought, yes, I like superheroes. Um, I don't really watch all the new Marvel videos or Marvel movies, but actually those 60s cartoons are awesome. So that's where this cover came from. Okay, on to the talk now. So as I said just now, um, I'll introduce myself because this is actually a conference talk. So my name is Tim. You can follow me here on Twitter. Um, I am Dutch, but I live in Paris. So born and raised in Amsterdam. And that's also why my accent is a little bit off. It's not entirely English. It's not really French and it's a little Dutch. Um, whatever. There you go. That's me. So I work as director of front end development at Valtec. And I'm also a media developer expert at Cloudinary. And I have a little bit of news that I am very proud to announce today in this video is that I am also a Nuxt ambassador. Yes, that just happened. And I'm really happy because you know what? I love Nuxt and Nuxt is in almost all my videos and all my talks. So there you go. Thank you guys. That's super awesome. Okay, now it's time for the talk. So what is new in Webpack 5? But first, I would say let's do a quick refresher on how Webpack actually works and why those new features in version five are so much better um, than what it was in, in, in version four, even though it's already cool, right? So here we go. So Webpack is a static module bundler for modern JS apps. I guess everybody kind of already knows this and you just use it as is and it works really well, right? So let's talk about what did we do before Webpack? Like Steve Ballmer is like truly back in the day when he was shouting developers. Look at him go, man, such majesticness. Anyways, so back in the day, we had static assets on our website, right? So we had them in the source and they were just pushed to the browser and that's it. If you had 10 JavaScript files, we would just serve 10 of them. Then we actually started to think about, okay, so now we have a lot of small files but then HTTP is a little bit slow. And if we load a lot of files, there's too much overhead, things are slow. So we decided, you know what? We need to concatenate them. And we had PHP magic, we had other stuff too, right? But we had some sort of magic where we can concatenate things. Like two JavaScript files would become one bigger file and that would actually be faster. And then we got things like YUI compressor and a whole bunch of others that I won't dive into now that made our lives a lot easier. But there was a lot of, you know, there's a big tool set. You needed a backend developer and a front ender to, to do all this stuff. And then jumping a whole bunch of steps here. But then we got to the era of Webpack, where basically Webpack still does magic, but actually it's not that magical. I have another talk. Um, or a video where you can actually see how Webpack really works on the inside. And I'll link it in one of those cards. But basically, um, Webpack would have a dependency graph. You would include everything into your main file. And then Webpack would be super smart based on loaders and all the things that it has to output highly optimized assets for your website. Wow, that was a crash course right there. So um, I photoshopped a lot for this talk. So um, I just kept like three or four of them in there and only for the parts that count because it was just too much work. So now with that we know Webpack, 
let's dive into what version 5 actually can give us, right? So um, there's a whole list here, right? So um, I know there's a bunch more that I'm going to tell you now, but this is more of a shorter um, video to get you inspired and try to use it, right? So faster builds with persistent caching. We have smaller bundle sizes. We have better long-term caching and the big one module federation, right? So let's dive right in. And I know people who are a bit more expert-like on Webpack, they know there's a bunch of other stuff. I know too, and I'm really excited. But for this video, we're gonna keep it relatively short. Okay, so how do we have faster builds, right? So basically the thing that they did is really smart. The, the caching is really good now. It was good already, but now you can also have cached stuff, module stuff that you use all the time on the file system, right? So it doesn't have to repopulate or recompile um, everything the moment you hit save or when you click build, right? So stuff that's in use all the time is actually cached. So it's much easier to grab and put in and therefore you have faster builds. It's a very simplified explanation, but this is actually really, really convenient. Then smaller bundle sizes. We all want smaller bundle sizes, right? And you get smaller bundle sizes generally by something called tree shaking. So a tree shaking is kind of like you have a whole tree of all this JavaScript stuff and stuff you don't need, you just snap off and you don't use. So Webpack 4 does this really well already, but in Webpack 5, it got way smarter. So they can actually, even if you use a, a specific part of a module, it can inside that module now also remove that code. So everything becomes even smaller. Really, really nice stuff, guys. I don't know how you do it, but it's, it's magical. Then we have um, better long-term caching, which is also a pretty interesting thing. And it's actually kind of an open door. But what they did now is if you add like, well, let's say what we used to have when you add anything to your file and you make another build, um, the file names would change based on a hash, right? The hash of the file inside. And therefore, if you now deploy all your stuff for a new deploy, all files are invalidated because they all have another name. So the browser have to refetch them. Um, now, if you add a comment or you change a variable name or stuff like that, it won't actually change the name of that junk for you anymore because there's not that much different. It still works, right? A comment doesn't change your code. A variable name doesn't change your code. So because of that, um, browsers can now um, cache the same way as they always did, but because the names don't always change on every update, you don't have to recache, right? So less cache invalidation and therefore better long-term cache. This is a really good one, guys. And then the big one. Um, I'm calling this the big one, module federation, because there's a whole bunch of cool stuff that now suddenly um, happens or is possible. Um, actually, module federation already worked in Webpack 4 through a really cool plugin. I'll link that below. But now it's native, right? So basically, I would say yay for micro frontends. Like in a whole bunch of projects that I do at work, which is pretty big enterprise stuff, for example, we have um, a whole bunch of separate applications for a, a car brand or a dealership, right? We have checking license plates is a little app. We have a car configurator is a little app. We have a checkout flow for all those different kind of, I lease this car, but I buy that part myself. And there's like, that's a little app. Like we have a whole bunch of applications. And the drawback of having all these applications is that you cannot really share your bundles. Every application has its own full bundle size. And you kind of want to figure out how you can actually expose certain features from certain bundles so apps can share, right? And this is what Module Federation does in Webpack 5. So basically each app or each bundle that you build can expose um, or ingest external components or functions or whatever. So you can make one bundle with the header and the footer and that's just exposed. And then all of the apps will just get those. And guys, this is life changing for big companies that have a whole bunch of applications all working with Webpack that now constantly has to serve all new bundles for every user. But now with Webpack 5, with Module Federation, this is no longer a problem. Yes, 
I can finally re-architect all those big systems and make it just way better for the end user. And that's what it's all about, right? So I went really quite fast over these. And um, now let's look at the breaking changes. Because basically what they did is they decided, okay, we have a new version now. There's a bunch of breaking changes. Let's do them all now. So in the future, we can be more stable because Webpack tends to be a system that is just, I set it and forget it. I touch it twice a year, right? It just works. So you don't want to have too many breaking changes over time. You just want to have it once. So fix your stuff, right? So what they did is from Webpack 4, there's a bunch of things that are deprecated. So right now, that deprecation um, warning, it still works, but it's a warning. And in Webpack 5, that's gone. So if you are moving to Webpack 5 and you have a whole bunch of those warnings, make sure you solve those warnings before moving. Then some of the built-in plugins have changed. Uh, we, don't, we won't discuss which those are, but it's like the way you give them properties and stuff like that. It's just streamlining things. Then, and this is a bigger one that has a bit of hate from some people is that by default, Webpack would actually polyfill a lot of things from Node.js, right? So if you build a Node component or a Node module, that would always work on the web because of some polyfills. And that's really, really cool. Um, but it's also a bit bloaty and it's like, now they decided to remove it and you can write your own polyfills to be super optimized. And it's also better for the code base of Webpack 5, but I can imagine people who are Node um, module builders um, probably now might get a bunch of tickets in there or issues in their GitHub saying, hey, but it doesn't work in the browser. And they might complain that they actually have to add support for Webpack now. You know what? I guess for the future, this is the way to go. You know, Dino is coming in at one point and so they kind of need to streamline stuff, but this is kind of a hard one. And now the last one, should you upgrade right now? I would say it really depends on your project, right? If you have a completely customized Webpack setup and you know what you're doing, you've worked with that all the time, this is an excellent moment to just switch, right? If you know it already, you have custom stuff, you can just update things. But if you use something like, you know, React scripts or the Vue CLI or whatever kind of packaging system that gives you all the features you want as Blackmagic, don't touch it just yet. Let React Scripts add V5, add Vue CLI, let v, wow, let Vue CLI add some new stuff and then just benefit later on, right? That's just the easiest way to go. So this was like super fast, like the Fantastic Five Webpack, um, an overview of Webpack 5. So I really want to thank you for watching and you can follow me um, at Tim Bennix on Twitter. You can also um, subscribe to me on YouTube where I do a whole bunch of those kind of videos. I have like 41 videos out now at the time of recording. So there's a whole bunch of stuff you can dive into. And last but not least, I actually decided to start a sponsorship or donations page at Buy Me A Coffee. Um, I have done this because there's so much work that goes into these kind of videos. This is probably like take 50, like it needs to be correct, right? So um, if you wanted to, please consider um, either subscribing or even donating. I would love you forever. And um, that's it. Thank you very much and um, have fun at your meetup. Cheers.